What is insulin resistance? And how does this relate to type 2 diabetes mellitus? Well, let's start with some background. Let's use, for instance, a typical patient with type 2 diabetes mellitus and look at the course of their life. If we were able to monitor their average blood sugar from birth through their mid-50s, with the quote normal range being anywhere from 70 to 99 we would see their average blood sugar with rare exception staying well within the normal range for many years however somewhere along their mid 30s you'd see this average blood glucose begin to rise and continue to rise eventually above a certain threshold if you will where a physician would be more likely to diagnose this hyperglycemia as type 2 diabetes mellitus. Now this can be diagnosed either through a random blood sample for a various number of tests that happen to show a blood glucose greater than 200 or a fasting blood glucose greater than 126 or even a hemoglobin A1c of 6.5 percent or greater. It would be at this point that the person receives a diagnosis for type 2 diabetes. But, but what many of us fail to take into account is that this diagnosis is just the physical manifestation of a problem that had been building for many years, perhaps as long as a decade before the actual diagnosis or label was given. Now this is typically in a person who has a genetic predisposition for insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes mellitus. Whether it were parents that had type 2 diabetes, grandparents, brothers, sisters, etc. The genes typically run in the family and when this person is placed in the wrong environment, typically that of excess calories, decreased activity, these genes are turned on and hyperglycemia ensues and it's the hyperglycemia that is harmful to the body over the course of years and decades. Now let's look closer at what's going on. Typically as a person's body changes, meaning increasing weight, we store fat in places that are obvious, underneath our skin, in places that you can pinch with your fingers. But what is less obvious is the fact that we store fat deeper than just underneath the skin. We start to store fat inside our abdomen, wrapping it around our organs, even in places other than our abdomen, up in our chest, around our heart, around our lungs. Now this excess fat is not only stored around organs in our body, but also in the organs in our body. And at the deepest level, we start to store excess fat inside of our cells. And it's the intracellular storage of these extra fat molecules that tend to cause dysfunction at the cellular level. Now what this looks like Internally, as you can see, a lean individual with very little subcutaneous fat and little to no intra-abdominal fat, no fat seen inside the liver. This is the stomach sliced in half. As this person's weight increases, you can see the subcutaneous fat increase, but also we start to see the body laying down fat around the organs and even some little dots within this liver. As this progresses, you see the expansion of the subcutaneous fat, which usually has a limit. And once that limit is reached, the body really starts to accumulate excess fat around the organs till it progresses to the point where you can see a tremendous amount of fat build up in the liver, which physically causes destruction of such organs. But on a deeper level, which we'll talk about in just a moment, 
and causes cellular dysfunction and the physiology of the normal human becomes erratic, dysfunctional, and things like hyperglycemia and other lab abnormalities ensue. What happens as we store extra nutrition in the form of fat inside of our cells is that the body becomes less sensitive to its own insulin. That's another way of saying insulin resistance. When the cell becomes resistant to the body's own insulin, it's another way of saying it's just not as sensitive to it anymore. Now as you can see, this person maintained fairly normal blood glucose for many years and that's because the pancreas compensated by secreting more insulin to overcome that resistance. And it did a good job of this up until say the mid 30s and it was at this point that the body just lost its ability to compensate to overcome this insulin resistance and when the body can no longer compensate adequately you begin to see elevated blood sugars and eventually the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes and over the years with continued hyperglycemia we see the consequences of hyperglycemia in the blood in the form of eye disease, kidney disease, nerve disease. Let's take a closer look at insulin resistance. Down at the cellular level, let's use for instance a muscle cell and this is a capillary and this is a vein. This is the distal most part of the body's cardiovascular system. This is the end point of the body's delivering oxygen rich and nutrient rich blood to the cell. The cell then uses these uh, nutrients and oxygen and then the oxygen poor and nutrient poor blood is delivered back to the heart, lungs and gut to start the cycle over. Now let's look at what happens when a normal non-diabetic person eats a meal who happens to have normal insulin sensitivity, no insulin resistance. They eat a meal and the digestive tract does its job to break down food into its simplest, smallest components. And for carbohydrates, that simplest, smallest component is glucose. Imagine a string of pearls, if you will. A string of pearls being a carbohydrate. The digestive tract will start to break apart that string of pearls until it gets down to individual pearls and those pearls represent glucose. When the digestive tract has separated the carbohydrate into its individual components, glucose, it can then be absorbed across the wall of the digestive tract into the bloodstream. So when you take a non-diabetic individual who eats a meal, they break down the carbohydrate, glucose gets absorbed, and the pancreas at the same time secretes insulin. And this is what happened. Insulin travels to the receptor, rings the receptor if you will, machinery inside the cell works appropriately to internalize glucose. And glucose inside the cell is then converted to energy. Glucose being the gasoline of the cells if you will. And this is what glucose is supposed to do. Spend a limited amount of time in the bloodstream, enough time to travel to the individual cells where it is delivered and internalized. Now let's look at an insulin resistant person who over the course of their life has worsening insulin resistance and eventually the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. But what happens is this person with the genetic predisposition for type 2 diabetes is placed in the wrong environment of excess fat and excess proteins. And over time, this excess nutrition is stored inside the cells. This causes cellular dysfunction, so these normal mechanisms are now hindered when this person goes to eat a meal. So let's take the same meal, for instance, that we saw earlier. 
this insulin resistant type 2 diabetic person eats the meal, their digestive tract does the same job of breaking down the carbohydrates into its individual components or glucose. Glucose is absorbed and the pancreas secretes insulin. Both are delivered again to the cell, but now insulin has trouble triggering the internal mechanism. So glucose is not internalized initially and it spends more time in the bloodstream. And that is until the pancreas can secrete much more insulin to try and overcome this resistance. And this is exactly what's happening for many years in patients who have insulin resistance building but whom do not have hyperglycemia or a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes yet. That's because the body is compensating by secreting more insulin to overcome the resistance and get this glucose in the cell. Fast forward years down the road when we have to inject insulin from the outside that is because the resistance has become so strong we need to inject insulin to overcome this resistance and force this glucose inside the cell and out of the blood. But what you can see is that over time forcing this extra nutrition inside the cell over and above what the cell actually needs it just begins to store the extra and the problem worsens. Meanwhile a significant amount of glucose stays in the bloodstream and that's why an individual with type 2 diabetes who checks their blood sugar by sticking their finger and using their glucometer will see a blood sugar of 170 instead of 70. It's because a significant amount of glucose is having trouble leaving the bloodstream and entering the cells. Now the benefit of plant-based nutrition, which we'll talk about in more detail in a few minutes, one of the main benefits is that plant-based nutrition is inherently low in fat and moderate in proteins. And this low fat nutritious lifestyle takes the burden of overnutrition off of the cells and allows the cell to metabolize this stored excess fat and protein inside and as it does this the machinery that was dysfunctional begins to regain function and over time the body can eliminate the need for the excess insulin that the pancreas used to secrete and the individual patient may even no longer require injected insulin because they've corrected the machinery internally, restored their insulin sensitivity. So now the body's own insulin can travel to the receptor level. And when this type 2 diabetic patient eats the same meal, all of a sudden they're able to absorb that glucose and immediately internalize it inside the cell and turn it into energy instead of the extra glucose remaining in the bloodstream where it is toxic over the long term. Does plant-based nutrition really work? Well this is one example of a patient of ours who kept immaculant fasting glucose records for many years and you can see the course of his fasting glucoses rising from the 150 to 200 range to 250 up into the 300s up into the 400s and eventually reaching a time when he was waking up in the morning with fasting blood sugars in the 500s then you see a dramatic improvement in his fasting glucoses that with rare exception have remained relatively well controlled Again, for a type 2 diabetic, having an average blood sugar of around 110 to 130 is considered excellent control. Now this is a typical profile of someone who may have undergone gastric bypass surgery and severely limited their intake of food and their absorption of food due to the surgery. But if you notice, this person did not change his weight significantly. In fact, what he did 
was a nutritional lifestyle change which allowed him to eat as much food as he wanted but at the same time rapidly improve his insulin sensitivity and as you can see over the course of a few years his weight has decreased maybe 20 to 30 pounds but he maintains continued blood sugar control the way he did this was by eliminating animal products from his diet he began a journey of plant-based nutrition and I need to be clear what this means in that he ate no meat including red meat white meat including chicken turkey pork uh, no fish no eggs no dairy products including cheese and very limited vegetable oils I need to make a clarification of some terms at this point we use the term plant-based nutrition which means a hundred percent of a person's nutrition comes from plants fruits vegetables whole grains and legumes also known as beans you may hear the term vegan or lacto ovo vegetarian or semi vegetarian those terms relay a spectrum of vegetarianism where on the one end you have someone who eats most animal products except for maybe red meat then next to that you'll see someone who eats no red meat or no white meat but does have dairy as you move down this spectrum of vegetarianism you progressively eliminate animal products all the way to the point of being entirely plant-based also known as being a vegan we use plant-based terminology just because we find it more descriptive and that it relays the thought of subsisting on entirely plants for your nutrition another benefit of plant-based nutrition is that our patients do not have to focus on portion control uh, scoops of this servings of that the size of this there's no need plant-based nutrition is inherently low in fat moderate in protein it is rich in carbohydrates but it's a complex carbohydrate meaning the carbohydrate is wrapped in a cage of fiber and that fiber makes it difficult for the body to extract the glucose this is a nutritional pattern not of depriving a person of food but of substituting food if you look at a typical Western meal breakfast lunch and dinner let's take lunch roast beef sandwich on white bread substitute that instead white beans with roasted garlic over long grain brown rice some broccoli and a raw pear for dinner instead of baked fish try a vegan lasagna with meat substitute with a robust salad and an apple there are many meat substitutes out there made from plants with the same texture and mouthfeel as meat that help many of our patients make that transition from eating meats to just eating plants there are uh, soy crumbles which look and taste and feel just like ground beef which absorb marinade quite well and it's indistinguishable to the palate there's a whole host of foods that help uh, make the transition to plant-based eating by providing meat substitutes there is a world of plant-based nutrition that are available if we just start to look and learn how to be successful in our clinic what we start with is some recommended reading some books that help further explain insulin resistance in the setting of type 2 diabetes mellitus and how nutrition impacts this disease process it is important to never stop learning about type 2 diabetes and the impact that food has on this condition because the more you learn the more you are empowered 
to take control of this process and set your own destiny. And it is our hope, avoid future medications, or if you're on a host of medications, have the ability to dial some back or even stop some. In the clinic, we will provide a food starter kit, which among other things, provides a grocery list and some starter recipes. Now, of the recommended reading, we start with Dr. Neil Barnard's program for reversing diabetes, available in bookstores or online. We have no financial ties uh, with this organization or this author. We do recommend his book because it is a good background in insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes and provides a great deal of insight for ourselves uh, as patients and physicians. Within the book you'll find recipes and ways to get started and links to his website which I will show you uh, in a little bit further. There are other books that you can purchase uh, which have a plentiful amount of recipes for plant-based nutrition for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, snacks, holidays, so that you can begin to learn not only how to shop but how to prepare this type of food to please not only you but also your family. A smaller book uh, is written for individuals to be able to go into a grocery store and navigate it expertly and fill the grocery cart with plant-based nutrition and easily make the transition from shopping with animals to shopping with just plant-based food. Supermarket Vegan by Donna Klein uh, has been uh, well received by our patients and is recommended. The Engine 2 Diet as written by a Texas firefighter, is full of robust, hearty meals made from plant-based nutrition, which many of our patients have enjoyed. Again, we have no financial ties to any of these authors. We've just had good success uh, with our patients, and they have, in turn, recommended these books to us. From Dr. Barnard's website, pcrm.org, uh, we have uh, downloaded and provided a vegetarian starter kit. We have updated his shopping list, which is a way to stock your pantry with the basics. These are things to start accumulating in your kitchen so that you can turn around and make recipes that you find in books or on the internet uh, without having to run back to the store for certain items. It's a way to be prepared. Here's a starter recipe we recommend to most of our patients, which is well received, called Raise the Roof Sweet Potato Vegetable Lasagna. This is a wonderful, hearty dish. Uh, it makes large quantities, uh, which will feed a large family and store well. These are crumbled cashews on the top, which actually give it a uh, ricotta cheese taste. Websites we recommend, as I mentioned earlier, pcrm.org slash health is a good place to start. This is Dr. Barnard's uh, resource online. If you click on Diabetes Resources, among other things, you'll find a wealth of nutrition and cooking classes in the form of webcast videos, Food for Life TV, TV webcast, our ongoing series uh, updated almost weekly. Uh, this is the Food for Life TV website. Let's scroll down. You can see the most recent webcast po uh, placed on the website celebrate St. Patrick's Day with stuffed cabbage rolls. These are uh, these are webcasts that not only show you how to shop but also how to cook with this type of food. It's an extremely helpful resource. Further down the web page, you'll see some core classes, also web-based as far as videos not only for type 1 diabetes, but for type 2 diabetes, which is what the majority of uh, diabetics around the world have. Other courses, the science behind plant-based nutrition for diabetes, classes about the glycemic index. Also within his website, you'll see the new power plate demonstrating the four food groups that we recommend our patients focusing on, which are fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes, also known as beans. And the grains and legumes are where we derive uh, our proteins from, and a broad variety 
of grains and legumes will provide all the essential amino acids uh, for men and women of all ages. Also on the website, you'll notice a 21 Day Vegan Kickstart, which is a helpful resource which starts with uh, preparatory emails educating patients how to shop and prepare for 21 days of guided plant-based nutrition. So if we click on this, you'll go to the Vegan Kickstart page. You'll see they have videos ready to prepare you. If you register, type your name and your email, you'll begin to receive emails before the actual start date and then daily throughout the 21 day period. It's a very helpful resource to make that transition to plant-based eating. They even have smart apps for smartphones. For instance, the iPhone. You can do the entire kickstart process on your phone. Another helpful resource is finding vegetarian restaurants in your area. Simply type in your zip code and see what restaurants uh, have been listed in your area. Or if you know of a restaurant that you've enjoyed that has good vegetarian meals, you can simply upload this information yourself and contribute to people in your community. Now, you might be thinking at this point, this sounds pretty hard. I don't know if I can do this. Well, I'd like for you to take a step back. Now, you may be thinking, this seems too hard. How am I going to make this transition over? What am I going to shop for? What am I going to fix? It does seem like a lot of effort, a lot of work to make the transition. That really is the nature of a lifestyle change. You are changing the way you look at food, shop for food, cook food, share food. But before you throw your hands up and say, this is just too hard, I, I don't even know where to start, I want you to take for example this same type 2 diabetic patient who stayed in the same nutritional lifestyle and watched hyperglycemia arise and worsen throughout the course of their life and know that around the time of diagnosis, as many of you already have, your first oral medication for type 2 diabetes is prescribed, uh, glucophage, uh, common trade name metformin, is prescribed and titrated up to the maximum dose. And eventually, if that is not enough to control blood sugar, a second medication from the drug class sulfonylurea is typically prescribed, which stimulates the pancreas to make more insulin to try to keep compensating for the hyperglycemia. But it's not long before a third medication is typically required. Again, this is the patient who has not taken, taken full advantage of lifestyle change in the form of nutrition and exercise. For a few years, oral medications can control the hyperglycemia fairly well, but eventually the oral medications are not as effective. We can substitute with some newer oral medications, possibly even some injectable medications. But the typical course uh, for most type 2 diabetic patients who have not been able to maximize their lifestyle change is to eventually require insulin or injecting extra insulin into our cells to overcome that insulin resistance starting with one insulin injection per day but eventually requiring insulin injections with every meal or four insulin shots per day not to mention checking your blood sugar not just one time per day in the fasting state but at least four times a day while you're using insulin with every meal and at bedtime. Also consider the effort it takes to go to the pharmacy 
every month to refill these medications. The cost or your co-pays for these medications, not only the insulin, syringes, test strips, but your oral medications, it adds up. Also consider the frequent doctor visits for managing these medications, increasing the doses, managing the side effects, starting new medications. It's a lot of back and forth to the doctor's office and the pharmacist. Think about all of that effort it's going to take to pharmacologically manage the hyperglycemia. What if you could rechannel all of that effort now and in the future? Rechannel that towards food and exercise. If you can put that amount of effort into initiating a change like plant-based nutrition, you will see the benefits of true lifestyle change on your insulin resistance in the form of blood glucose coming down to normal. And it is our hope to keep you from requiring additional medications, or if you're on a host of medications, perhaps being able to dial them back down as you become more sensitive to your body's own insulin. Ultimately, if you're able to stop some of these medications, that would be the ideal situation. Now, in our experience with plant-based nutrition, there are keys to success. Number one, be committed to plant-based nutrition for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks. Water intake. Many of us are chronically dehydrated. Not only do we not drink enough water, but we ingest caffeine and alcohol daily, which causes us to urinate more and become more dehydrated. I recommend at least three liters of water per day. Avoid soda, including diet soda, because the caffeine serves to further dehydrate you. Avoid fruit juice, because now that you're eating more fruits on a daily basis, you don't need fruit juice. Fruit juice is really just sugar water from the fruit fortified with extra vitamins. But again, if you're eating the fruit daily, you don't need the juice. Stick to pure water. A maneuver that my patients uh, who have been successful at increasing their water intake have used is go to bed with a container of water. When you wake up in the morning, the water is waiting for you. You sit on the side of the bed and finish it before you start your day. That way, no matter what comes, you've at least had some hydration. The flip side of that is forgetting to drink water throughout the most of the day, coming home, noticing that we're thirsty, drinking some water when we get home and with dinner, maybe before bedtime, but drinking it so fast because we're so thirsty, end up waking up throughout the course of the night to urinate, which interrupts our sleep. The key is to start the hydration early in the day. Be aggressive, get an adequate amount, an adequate amount of water before you even come home at the end of the day. So at that point, you can taper off your water intake and not have to be up all night urinating. Family support is essential. We recommend including your family in the shopping, cooking, as well as the eating. We also recommend that you bring your family to follow-up visits to clinics so they can understand what you're going through with your condition and the reasoning behind aggressive lifestyle change. Nutritional fasting, meaning taking in no food for 24 hours, uh, has been a successful maneuver by many of our patients. Uh, you continue to drink plenty of water and stay hydrated, but pick one day a weekend, say one time per month. Uh, and this type of nutritional fasting uh, seems to enhance a person's insulin sensitivity and reset the cells, if you will, uh, towards being more sensitive to your body's own insulin. If you find that your blood sugars are creeping up for whatever reason, incorporating a nutritional fast once per month has been a successful maneuver. As always, plan ahead 
and when you cook this food try to cook in large quantities and along those lines large containers uh, will help you uh, store the extra food so if you want to spend one day a weekend making food for the week you can eat off of this from the large containers in the refrigerator all week it's much more convenient that way plant-based nutrition typically has no animal products in it to spoil there's nothing to go rancid and the worst that uh, plant-based uh, food typically encounters is drying out always be learning not only the website for uh, pcrm.org that we have discussed earlier uh, but also talk to your grocery store manager visit your farmers markets talk to these people uh, about fruits and vegetables learn try new fruits and vegetables that you've never tried before come home look them up on the internet find a recipe and expand your food horizon it's a way to not let yourself get into a rut as far as eating the same thing last but certainly not least exercise what we recommend is at least 30 minutes per day five days a week of either uh, aerobic exercise or resistance training but the combination of the two seem to be the most beneficial for our patients either brisk walking for 30 minutes per day or on another day do a resistance training with uh, resistance bands those rubber bands with with handles on them uh, or very light uh, weights uh, I encourage you to start low weight and go slow to avoid injury uh, if injury is a significant concern for you or you're limited by uh, certain disabilities or say chronic back pain or knee pain I recommend swimming daily as an option to reduce your risk of injury and take the stress off your low back and knees get in a swimming pool with the water up to your waist or up to your mid chest and simply walk back and forth as fast as you can being in the water reduces your body weight and takes a tremendous amount of stress off your back and joints while at the same time engaging many of your large muscle groups and enhancing your insulin sensitivity and remember you can do this we look forward to helping you